Welcome to the Prevail Over Cancer podcast, where we take a metabolic approach to help guide you on preventing, prevailing, and striving over cancer. We are live on the Prevail Over Cancer podcast with my co-host, Keith Bishop. This week's conversation is an interesting one, and it's one that I never thought I would have to deal with. And and when I did, I, I, I took action pretty quickly. But I think this is a question that, that anybody that's diagnosed with cancer struggles with, and it's preparing once you find out. What are the next steps? How do you get yourself ready for the biggest battle of your life. And individuals like yourself, Keith, are a massive part of helping people through those moments, um, not only physically through diets, supplements, also preparing themselves mentally, being able to get themselves in the right mind and state of mind to be able to fight this battle. Like we, we you've said this in a prior podcast where it's like, this is Olympics now. Like this is this is time to go, and you get on a regular basis because you work with so many people that are just been diagnosed with cancer. What are what are the early questions that people seem to ask you? Well, usually I have to admit most of the people that I see, although I have one this afternoon that's going to be a new diagnosis, but usually they've already been kind of going through it okay. and. Uh, later, like stages, later stages. Yeah. Um, usually, they've already been through a lot of the medical things that aren't working, and so I have to admit I don't get very many. Probably only like maybe two out of ten. You know, are are recent diagnosis. You know, that's just brand new uh, for me. Most of them have already been, started this process, and so it's um, you know I'm I'm not necessarily you know, helping them to deal with those initial emotions and and frustrations and and just everything that's going on with that but like i mean you are you know probably a better source of of some information about the, that initial type thing so what are some of the things that what were those first thoughts and needs that that you had i mean fear and i i think the first initial feeling that i that i had was fear I mean, that is the first initial reaction. I think anybody that's ever diagnosed with cancer is fear. Fear is how long I'm going to be around. I'm going to make it through this. I'm going to see my, 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 my daughter walk down the aisle. Like all these Damn. things are running through your mind, your children, your parents, everyone, where is this like, how is this happening to me? Is that, is that, that, that question of like, this is not happening, but I, I might be a little different than most people where I took initial action within the 24 hours where it's like that initial feeling of fear and 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 feeling and, and why me and that sorry and that all changed where it's like okay I, I i gotta i gotta get on this i cannot let this control me and one thing i realized with the medical system in canada you're just a number in the u.s where you're from it's more there's a lot more private care so if you do have the funding i'm sure you could get quicker service but in canada you're just a number so you're actually yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not like that either huh so we'll talk about that we'll talk about yeah. that so i think the first thing is there's four things i think that are very important and i think we're 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 a huge part of my original success was one being an advocate for myself you have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to be persistent and push. Within the first 28 days, I had my MRIs done. I had my scopes done. I had my, my CT scans done. I had booked an oncologist. I had booked a radiologist. I had already booked a surgeon. This is all within 28 days. It doesn't happen usually like this. And how I did this was I was a massive advocate for myself. I would get on the phone and call and call sometimes seven, eight, 10 times a day till I got that appointment. Right. You have to be an advocate. Do not sit back as a cancer survivor. I'm telling you guys, do not sit back and wait for people to do stuff for you. Do not go. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So you were saying? No, exactly. And that's so true. And you just have to work at it, work at it, work at it. So the biggest issue we have here is going to be like we call them HMOs, health maintenance organizations, and and it's the same thing. It's just like it, it's going to be a month before you get in to go see an oncologist. You know what is that? 
you yeah. know, and, and so that's where, you know, th- you know, there are things that you can start doing. And we'll talk about that too. There are definitely things you need to start doing besides be, uh, the initial thing. You've got to make those appointments. You've got to call, you got to pull strings, you've got to contact friends and associates and, and do whatever you can. The next thing is, like I said, one of the first thing was be an advocate for yourself. The next thing is, I always said was surround. I eliminated automatically any negativity in my world. You have to surround yourself around positive people. They're going to be there for you. Because in moments like that, you get a lot of individuals, and you'll see that very quickly, that become that start driving this negative energy towards you. And you cannot have anything that bring you down at that moment. You need to be as positive, as focused as possible. So I eliminated anything in my world that didn't align with my 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 goals at that moment which was surviving cancer and getting and 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 healing myself so i eliminated i was at that point i was running podcasts i was doing all these things i was writing another book i eliminated all those things anything i could put aside for the first three or four months just to really hone in and focus i did so eliminate yourself with negative people eliminate yourself with things on your daily do list that do not have to be there so you can focus your energy and your time towards fighting this and beating this. I think that's another thing is, is, is your time management. I think it's so important once you are diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Right. So how did you keep from just, you know, just dwelling over and over and over and over again with, you know, all your concerns and about the future and family and things like that? Okay. After within 24 hours of being diagnosed, I I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, you have to just control the controllables. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I've talked about in business. These are things, these are messages that I've been talking about for years with other entrepreneurs and helping other people is control the controllables. And once I did that, where it's like, okay, the thing I'm going to control today is booking an oncologist. And that's all I was focused on. Mm -hmm. Once that's booked, okay, the next step. And the next step is a domino effect where I just control what I can control. If something was out of my control, I can control the cancer spreading. I can control stuff like that. But I was controlling everything I could at that moment. We'll talk about a diet, supplements. I was doing everything I can to increase my, my chances of beating this. But at the same time, too, just focusing on what was in front of me at that moment. I wasn't thinking of the future. I wasn't thinking of six months from now, a year from now. I was like, okay, today, this date, this is what I'm going to do. Tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do. And it's just control what was in front of me at that moment, the controllables. So be an advocate, control the controllables, surround yourself around positivity. And the last thing was, and I did from the minute I found out was, and fill yourself with as much information as possible. Right. Because there is a lot of, Wackery or whatever you want to call it out there, because there's a lot of people trying to make money on cancer because it's a billion dollar industry. So right. it's not it's okay to to listen and read, but file as much information as possible. I went on a, a rampage where I think I read like twelve books within a two to three week period. I surrounded myself with individuals like yourself, other experts, and I surrounded myself with people that knew a lot more than I did, and I just sucked in all that knowledge and tried to learn everything I could about this disease. Mm -hmm. What are the future outcomes? How could I fight it? How could I build my immune system up? How could I, how everything, everything. And I, and I started, and once I found one thing out like saunas, I would just go on a rabbit hole and just learn as much as I can about saunas and the effects. And then I would learn about a supplement, learn as much about that supplement and just fill myself with as much information as possible that I was building almost this this library of resource that I knew that it would the as long as I live this is going to be a benefit for me. Mm-hmm. And and that was another step too was just really informing myself and learning as much as I could in the quickest period as possible. So when I sat in front of an oncologist, when I sat in front of a surgeon, when I sat in front of a doctor, it I wasn't in like this this mindset of like I have no clue what they're saying to me. I already was so informed that when the call just says A, B, and C, this is what I want you to do. I already had in my head the actual outcome and, and the resources in my head to understand that if he's going to give me this option, these are the side effects. These are, and then I can make a, an educated decision for my myself and my family that would be best for us. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's what I've got, you know, on the, you know, on, on I have a, a list. Uh, matter of fact, 
you know, we talked about what our topic was going to be for this week. And so I went through and I have the seven steps of just diagnose. Well, I thought, you know, I, I really need to change that because I'm definitely, uh, I'm a very list oriented, you know, person and probably due to business, you know, over the years and, and it just always, you know, I, I've got to work off of a list to help keep me focused. And, but also I, I haven't, except for my family history, but not a, an individual myself history of cancer. The, it's like, I just don't know some of those emotions, you know, that, that you have to deal with and, and the initial thing. But for me, it, it still is going to be the, you know, that list. I got to keep that list. What, what, what is your list? What are uh, your list, top things? The top things actually, like the number one thing I have is get the facts. And like you're talking about just then about, you know, listening, what, you know, what, you know, where is the cancer? You know, what, what is it? Has it spread? You know, and, and we got to get more information sometimes. So some of these things we can't always answer, you know, uh, what are, uh, what tests are available and, and just trying to gather all that information and, and, but listing that and listing those answers and, and part of the goal. So I, I, I and my clients won't be just kind of going through that time and time and time and time again. And, you know, and, you know, keep, you know, researching that. I've, okay, I've got that information and I know where it's at. I know what it is. I don't need to worry about that. You know, I need to go down to the next, you know, list on that. So, you know, and then, then we go into the treatments, you know, what are the side effects and, you know, what are those options and, you know, what, what are the surgeries, what are the medications, uh, what happens if I don't do this? I have a lot of people asking me that. You know, about, you know, what if I don't do the medication? What if I don't do the surgery and, you know, and things like this? Another common thing, one of the most common questions I have is, and I want to ask you about this. People will ask me what, uh, or so-and-so, my friend, my family member says, I need to take this. You know, how do you handle that? What do you, what do you do with that? Yeah. So like I said, I'm very open to everything. And I've learned to be open to everything, but I do my own due diligence, my own research on it. And I get that all the time. I actually get it through social media because through our podcast, through just me being an advocate of for as a cancer survivor, I get DMs on a regular basis. And people are like, have you tried this protocol? Have you tried this protocol? Have you tried this protocol? And and some of them just, I mean, whether they work or not, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't go that route. I wouldn't put those things in my body. But you have to just do the proper research. And, mm -hmm. and and another thing too is when you're reading reviews on certain products, remember most reviews are fake. So don't go to a website and read reviews of how these people are surviving because 99.9% .9 of those reviews are fake. So understanding that you're going to do that and you need to speak to somebody in real life and that is living, that's been through it, that, that tested this. So reaching out to individuals if somebody's coming and say hey have you tried this or have you tried this you can do the research you can find out the, the source of it then when you reach the source of it then say hey do you have any individuals that you've worked with that i could speak to mm -hmm. and then you start that that you start in that rabbit hole to do your own research because you're once you're diagnosed every single person is going to come out and have a, a solution or or like exactly said somebody that had my uncle had cancer and, and he drank seaweed grass and now he's 100% cured. Like he's like, could it have worked for him? Possibly. I'm sure there's other things that he did that you're not hearing about. And when I look at cancer too, Keith, is I look at it as, and I've talked to you about this. If something's going to give me a 0.001% chance of being this cancer, and if it's safe and not going to cause any other harm to my body, I'm most likely going to do it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's sauna, whether it's supplements. So in my head is you cannot look at one thing and say, here, if you pull this pen, you're not going to get cancer. This might actually have some benefit to you, but you still have to tackle it from everywhere, from your diet, yeah. from right. your relieving your stress relief, from stunning, from possibly cold plunging, from, from, supplements from environment, which is our last podcast. There's right. so many factors that cause it. And I think the last thing that people don't really, and I think is very important once you're diagnosed is the medical system is going to mask it with medicine. Right. 
you have to find the root cause. You have to look at your last two, three, four, five years terrain of your life and see what caused it. Were you on some crazy diet? Were you on an all meat diet? Were you high strung, high stress? They, they actually, there's many studies now that allocate that, that show the connection between a very stressful moment in your life, 18 to 20 months prior to you getting that cancer, whether you divorce, a death of a loved one, which that high level of stress in your life could have triggered something. So you have to look at what it was, find the root cause, find the root cause. So you could actually evaluate the root cause and start a new path. That's going to push you away from the root cause and, and, and not get you back in that hole. Right. It takes, you know, it's actually a, a minimum of a five-year process from the initiation of a cancer cell to a, a, a tumor that can be seen or felt or scanned or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's not an immediate type thing. It's a long-term process. So a, a close friend of ours many years ago, one, um, uh, she she went through a a significant weight loss. Uh, she did the, a stomach procedure and lost hundreds of pounds, and ended up with you know breast cancer. Uh, that I mean, when they know when she was diagnosed, I mean it was everywhere. I mean, just all of a sudden, and she really didn't have that many nodules, you know, here. But what happened was she had some, just you know, but she was a young person. They weren't, you know, doing scans or screenings, you know, with a young person. Uh, but also she had released so many fat. I mean, when she burned the fat cells, she released so many hormones. Those hormones were stimulating, you know, and so hormones are fat soluble. So she actually, in her case, I think lost way too much body fat too quick and faster than her body could handle it. And so, you know, if, I, I feel like that was probably, we don't know for sure, but that was the one thing that was like significant in her life and uh, that stress, you know, and also detoxing and, and, and such like that. So, yeah, and it, we always have to try to figure out what we, you know, go back and look at that history and, and try to figure it out uh, and try to make changes. If we don't make changes, uh, we can't expect different results. Let's, let's talk about that quickly. So. Every time I visit an oncology and I sit in a in a in an office in a waiting room and there's 150 people in there and I've messages to you we've talked about this many times. I'm sitting there I'm looking around and people are drinking cans of Coca Cola. People are eating donuts, and I'm like, how are you not making the changes to your diet to your lifestyle? But then when I first talked to oncology, to my surprise, my oncologist, great guy. Um, really, really enjoy him. But his thing to me was don't change your diet. Do what you're doing. You're fine. These, these, this treatment is going to change everything. And they don't understand why this probably, if you look at stats, 80, 90% of people that do chemo that don't do the needed changes to their lifestyle, that cancer comes back. Mm -hmm. And it's because you haven't dealt with the root cause of the problem, whether it's your diet, whether it's your stress, whether it's your environment, whether it's your work environment, whether you're around toxins. And hearing a doctor that you got to put your trust into tell you that, hey, you're fine. Eat what you want. Just don't lose weight. Eat what you want. Don't lose weight. Right. When I got diagnosed, I was 194 pounds. Now I'm 165 pounds soaking wet and I'm in best shape of my life. And I got a six pack and I feel incredible. And and when I was losing that weight, the oncology was like, you're losing weight, you're losing weight. And I'm like, no, I'm eating right. I'm doing the right things. I'm sawning, I'm working on, I'm taking care of myself. So don't look at the number, look at my health, look at my blood work, look at everything else. And I was the one telling the doctor, but I was the one being an advocate for myself. So really understanding that you need to really make those changes and it's got to be a lifestyle. You got to mm -hmm. put in your head, I got diagnosed with cancer. If I want to be around for the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, I have to make these changes and it's not going to be something I'm going to fall back into my bad habits. It's got to be something you're going to do the rest of your life. Exactly. And, and go, sorry. No, exactly. You just got to make those changes. And it's kind of like, you know, it, and I think I mentioned this in another podcast, but it's, it's um, a, a country road, blacktop road or gravel road, whatever, you know, it's a rough road and it's going to misalign my truck. The tires are going to wear out. I'll have to keep buying new tires. Uh, and until 
we fix that road and take care of that underlying base problem, it's going to continue to be a problem. So same thing with our food and our lifestyle. We got to try to figure out those things and, but we can't make all the changes all at once. And it's kind of, you know, we got to have that list. Okay. Well, okay. I'm reading this book. I'm talking to this person. Okay. So I'm going to make, you know, uh, this is the change I'm going to do this week. Get this down. And so, you know, in my fact, a lot of people feel overwhelmed, you know, when they start following me and, and seeing hundreds, I don't know, maybe I've got a thousand, I think I've got over a thousand posts now, but anyway, they, they start, yeah, I can't do all of that. No, don't just pick one thing, make one change, you know, and that's going to be it for the next few days or a week or so, get that under your belt, you know, and, and take care of that. And then you go and, and make the next change. I want to challenge everybody out there. And I want everyone to hear this and understand this. If you're diagnosed with cancer and in three years you're on deathbed and you have a couple of days left in you, you're going to regret very much so that you didn't force yourself to make those changes and stick with those changes. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people don't want to make those changes. They want to eat the sugar. They want to make those, they want to still enjoy their lifestyle. They want to be in this, like they're not making the changes they need to. Right. But when it comes down to it, that's going to be their biggest regret. Exactly. Yes, so I understand yeah, I that. One, yeah, exactly. I had one client and we were going through his foods and it, he's a very large man, extremely large man. And, um, and I said, so what are you, what did you have for lunch yesterday? Uh, SpaghettiOs. Okay. And, uh, and what did you have for dinner last night? Uh, ravioli. Out of the can. Yeah. You know, and and so I said, well, you you need to make a change, and and so you know, you need to go more simple foods. And at the end of the conversation, uh, the, the Zoom meeting wasn't over yet. I hadn't turned, clicked it off yet. I heard him say, "Well, we won't be doing that again," you know. And and I guarantee, you know, he's not going to survive because he's not making he's not making any changes whatsoever. He's looking for a quick fix, a pill, or treatment. And, and that we can't rely on that. You know, we've got to make these other little changes. No, because you, one thing with chemo, and I'm sure chemo has helped many people, but people have to understand with chemo, when I did my research with chemo and understanding chemo is most people that do chemo still die. And there's a reason why is chemo does kill the bad cells. But chemo still does poison the shit out of your body. And if you're not ready to do everything else to keep your immune system strong and doing everything else to keep your body as, as vibrant and as healthy as possible through that process. And after that process, it's hard for your body to beat that. So you have to, if you're decide to go that route with chemo, where you are at a level right now where you need to attack it aggressively, which some people do have to, and I understand that. But if you are going to go that route, you have to understand that your diet, your supplementation, your rest, your mindset, your stress levels, you have to be at another level. And this is past chemo, even a year after chemo, two years. It's got to, you got to get your body because that, that long-term effect of chemo, it doesn't end when you stop doing chemo. That stuff destroys your body for six months to a year after. So you really have to have your body aligned with everything you possibly can to build your body to this 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 level of immunity where it's like your body is so healthy and if you're not ready to do that chemo is just going to kill you i don't care which doctor tells you chemo will kill you if you're not going to do all the other stuff that somebody like like individual like yourself keith that could help you align yourself with the right supplements and 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 also just the wear and tear on your body right mentally doing all that stuff being able to do the supplements through the whole process that are going to take a lot of that stress off your body, right? Exactly. And and it's, it's kind of like take the stress off, but also, you know, eating certain ways and, and, and really just doing the right things, but eating certain ways and exercise and and targeted supplements can actually actually enhance the effectiveness of chemotherapy and radiation. So so you know it's a combination of things. And so we have to hit it from many different ways. You know, like like we've we've been talking about. So we can't rely on one thing. You know, we can't just take a, one pill, a supplement, and just say, 
oh, well, so-and-so said that, you know, drinking this green whatever drink, you know, they cured him of cancer. Uh, you can't rely on that, you know, and it, we have to do as many things as we can. And and it's impossible to do everything all at once, but we got to learn and, and keep making those changes and keep adding to the list, adding to the list, adding to the list and creating a, a, a different lifestyle. Lifestyle. I like that word, lifestyle. It is. It is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. If somebody reaches out to you and and I want individuals that are listening to this podcast to understand uh, uh, Keith is a bundle of knowledge and I'm, I'm very grateful that um, we've connected and we've become friends. If you are diagnosed, I mean, most people are going to not have a clue what to do next. And being, like I said, being an advocate for yourself is very important, but also surrounding yourself around other individuals. And so with social media, there is so much information out there that can be overwhelming. Like you said, even if you're just following you with a thousand posts, it could be overwhelming in a way. Sure. But do not push away from reaching out to somebody and having a consultation like Keith. Just at least, if 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 anything, just to set a almost a list, as you said, a list of what to do within the next couple of things, couple of months or a couple of weeks, like, okay, right. talk to Keith and say, okay, Keith's going to say, hey, you're going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, this is what you're going to do. And that not only talk about nutrition and supplements, but I'm talking about also aligning yourself with what scans, what to find, what to do, because the, the, there's going to be that period where there's going to be a lot of unknown. When I got diagnosed, it was November 23rd. I went, 2022, I went home, talked to my family. We were all like, whatever, this is insane. This is not happening. This is almost that, that disbelief. This can't happen to me because I had no family history. Uh, a couple of days later, I did a genetic test. I had no genes, but I didn't know if it had spread. They just found a tumor in my rectum. So we didn't know how far it is. We didn't know if it got to lip nodes. We didn't know nothing at that point. So at that point, it was almost two and a half weeks before I actually found out through the MRIs, through the CT scans that it hadn't spread as of yet. And those two and a half weeks is there's a lot of unknown that could cause a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of questions. So surrounding yourself with individuals like Keith that deal with this on a daily basis could take a lot of those stress and anxiety away. Yes. So, and I think that's the, the hardest part is that unknown until you find out what we are dealing with. And now we can set a plan to deal with it. So understanding the paths and controlling what the control, control the controllables is so important the first couple of weeks because the anxiety and the stress levels are going to be so, so high. And when you're looking at cancer, especially, I mean, there's stats and I was just, this is a topic for another day, but since 2019, I think it's 44% of, um, it's been a 44% increase in cancer in individuals under 50. Mm. And, and so, I mean, the people are, some people are lying out with the COVID vaccine. People are like, there's a lot of different things, but, but there is also a lot of issues during that year and a half of closure where people were home, they're eating junk food, they're eating differently, exercising less. So there's a lot of factors that were into all that, right? But when you look at that number, it's not something where when I grew up as a kid, I'm 47, cancer is something you would hear somebody at the later later part of their life they were going to get. Mm -hmm. I never knew anybody till I was a young adult that had cancer. I didn't even hear about it. And all of a sudden now it's like with social media, maybe because I'm in yourself or involved in this in this field now. It's like I'm every single day I'm hearing, oh, 26-year-old diagnosed with cancer, 33-year-old just died of cancer. It's just, it's just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. right. So that overwhelming is also putting a lot of pressure on yourself that if you just got diagnosed, but also your family, your friends, all that stuff. So what when you're looking at that and, and the numbers are growing and all that stuff like that, and this will be a talk for another day, but where is that mindset where it's like, okay, I got diagnosed. Who should I be talking to first? Who should I be reaching out first? Who should I be like, where, where, where would your advice be if somebody just, you just found somebody else that's younger, that just got diagnosed? What would you, and like I said, with social media, there's so much information out there. Where would you reach out to first? Oh, let's see. I think, well, probably the best source 
Um, social media is overwhelming. There's a lot, I mean, so many people. Matter of fact, I saw a new account today that had like 600,000 followers. I've never seen this guy before at all. And, you know, and it's like, you know, how, what, you know, why haven't I heard anything about him? I mean, you know, it's kind of weird, but how that just popped up all of a sudden. But, you know, uh, so it, it's a little bit overwhelming, but there are what are called in the United States, we call them functional medicine practitioners. And so you can do an internet search for functional medicine practitioners to help out some, and um, uh, but they're typically not covered on insurance. And so you you have to be careful about that. Uh, you can ask, meaning just financially, sometimes that's a challenge and, and they can be very expensive. They're also probably the best doctors you know, in helping you, you know, guide that on what to do, what to eat, you know, how to integrate. Uh, they are not uh, just telling you not to do other things, meaning uh, they're not just alternative, they're an integrative doctor. So they will, you know, they are trained as a, a healthcare professional. They could be in, in the United States, we have nurse practitioners that are wonderful, you know, sources uh, of, of help and appointments and, and helping get diagnostic procedures done and things like that. The, uh, I think it's just more, I, I have to admit, I'm not sure. I think by referrals and friends and sharing information, I, I guess. So uh, well, what's your thought on that? I, I have to admit, I don't know. I'm on a, I'm a little different place. You know, people do find me, but usually it's a referral. Usually matter of fact, it's more like Keith, I had three people tell me I need to come see you. <laughs> you know, or talk to you. And so often it's that, you know, that we kind of, re, you know, re, re, the first person, oh, well, yeah, okay, I've heard about that, you know, and then second person and the third person, they go, oh, God has told me I need to go come see you. And often that's, you know, kind of a, an issue for me. I mean, that's how people find me. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I first got diagnosed, but I'm, I think I'm a little different. That's what scares me is a lot of people aren't, aren't built like me mentally, right? Where in my mind was, I had to be an advocate. I had to push and I had to research and research and find. I, I went on a mission, like a, literally I, I put my combat boots on and I was like, let's go. And and it was just like, and I created lists, just like you said, I created lists and I, and I, and I journaled everything. That's another thing too, for great for people is journal everything. Journal yes. is very important because I think this is actually a good topic we should talk about, but uh, journaling is very important because I still have my books is I actually would write how I felt that day. Was I feeling anything different? Was I noticing anything different in my body? Um, and, and because and then I actually started writing down everything I started eating and seeing how my body reacted with that. And I would weigh myself every day. So I literally kept a health journal, how much I weighed, what I was eating, how much fluid I put in my body and also how I felt. And I, and that was, and then I would have a separate journal where it was like, this is my do list. Okay, I got to find an oncologist. I need to find this. I'm going to research this this books today. I'm going to listen to these podcasts. And I just started filling myself with information, but at the same time, dialoguing and, and, and writing down everything that was happening to me. So I could literally go back in a week or two weeks when I saw an oncologist say, hey, I got diagnosed this day. This is what the changes I've made. This is what I'm doing. And you could actually have something visually to put and explain to somebody else when they talk to an individual like yourself. So that way, if I reached out to Keith and I say, Hey, Keith, and I did that actually with you, these are the supplements on. And then Keith is say, okay, you know what? An individual like Keith that has so much experience to say, Hey, Jeff, you know what? Maybe we should eliminate this and try this or add this or double this up. That's not enough of a dose. And then also, if you are going to start the process of supplements or anything like that, the brand names, what are you taking? What forms? So when you do reach out to individuals like Keith, he, he can look at them and say, hey, this this has this much fillers or this has, and you could start breaking down. So writing down everything you're taking and the brands you're taking, if you are in a supplement, is so important. So when you finally do reach an individual that has more experience than you that can help you, you have everything documented and ready to go kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so one of my goals is to prioritize that list. So, yeah. you know, it's not unusual. Why people they will come into my office and and they'll bring in their box or their sack. They may have 30, 40, may even more bottles sometimes, you know, of things that they're trying to take. And and even I had one senior assistant lady, she'd come in every week and buy a new supplement. And then I said, Well, you know, are are you going to health food store? Oh yeah. 
are you buying things from them? Oh, yes. I said, you know, so I went to her house and literally she had hundreds of bottles and under her kitchen cabinets had drawers made to put all of her bottles and stuff. And so, uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to let you buy anything from me, you know, because you you can't be doing this. And so so I try to prioritize that based off of of their health concerns and things like that. And you had another thought, too. So what do you think about like this initial shock and, and trying to plan things out? What do you think about future goals? What's your thought on that? I, I I I love that. I mean, I've I've always been this type where whether it's business, whether it's lifestyle, whether it's my children, I always goal prioritizing and then setting smaller goals and mini goals to get them is very important to my day to day life. That, that's that's with everything I do. So I think goal setting is very very important, and that could go towards supplementation increasing that could go towards your diet that could go towards water consumption that could go towards juicing there's so many different levels sauna i'm going to start off five minutes a day my goal in in two weeks three weeks is to be up to 12 minutes and you start building up these mini goals and you start seeing the benefits from them and as you start seeing the benefits that hopefully will give you enough motivation to continue them right so setting goals i think is so 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 important that was something i did i did that and Setting goals, you always hear these stories, Keith, and somebody that's been diagnosed with cancer and they had a goal. What I mean is my goal was to see my grandson graduate school or my goal was to see some, that gives somebody a, a reason to live. Yes. Yeah. That's where I was going. <laughs> that's yeah. Where was... yeah. 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 I think that's so important. And I've set goals. I've set long-term goals. I I can't stress this enough. Looking at my daughter and being like, and 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 being like, I got to walk her down the aisle. That, that's a that's a long term goal. I got to be there for that. Seeing my my son's had a lot of medical history uh, when he was initially born, and he's and he's and he's battled through all these things, and he was diagnosed with CP, and he's overcome them all, and he's had become this little baseball star. And it's like, I want to see where this takes him. I I, I got to be there for this journey. I've been here from day one. I got him out of his. I got him into braces. I got him out of his AFOs. I got him running a marathon. There's there's a lot more to this story still, right? So I have in my head, I, 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 that was, it's funny you're saying this because that was one of the big things that motivated me at the beginning that kept me really positive. It was like, I got long-term goals. I got to travel more. I got to see different things. I want to be around. I, I, I have to outlive this person. Like, it sounds crazy, but it's like, I had these goals in my head. And, and I think that gave me inspiration and motivation to do the day-to-day things to get me there. Exactly. And that's where I, that's one of the things I ask my clients is, you know, what is your goal? What, what's your big picture, your vision? Um, and if necessary, you know, even where you can put a, a, a picture, you know, up of that and screensaver and, 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 uh, you know, whether, you know, on a computer, phone, whatever, yeah. but we have to be reminded of that. And then you know, in my mind, and, and once again, it's, it's kind of like a, a business and growth, uh, type mindset but it's like okay that's my main vision that's my main goal the then i have these other low goals and steps yeah you know that i can write down and and you know keep in the journal and keep that going and then but i still see that picture and 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 they help me with that vision so that that vision is i think extremely important we have to have that purpose purpose I love that word. I love that word. And I use that all the time. It's, it's, it's funny because I ran a, a, a men's program for a while helping um, men become better dads. And, um, and it was called a man's purpose. And I think having a purpose and having your long-term goals makes everything else seem to make sense. Because now you see the progress and you see these little micro goals, these little day-to-day things where it's like, okay, if I take the supplement every single day, my immune system is a little healthier. So my body's now, the cells are able to kill the bad cell. It's just a whole process. Mm-hmm. But if you don't do these day-to-day things, those long-term goals mean shit. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's not, it's not going to work. Yeah. So we have to have, the, have to have that big picture and then we break it down in, in the list. And we just keep talking about that, but you know, the, the list, you know, I, in, in the journal is you know, I, I think the key, we have to have it written down and, and we don't have to have a, a, a micro thing of every single little thing that we're doing. How many times we go to the bathroom? We don't have to do that, but you know, we do need to have, 
you know, you know, what we're taking, uh, you know, and, and like this week where I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to change and try to start doing, you know, intermittent fasting, you know, and start that process. And, and I'm not going to be perfect at it, you know, and but I'm going to start that process and, and see, can I do 12 hours without food? What happens if I don't have breakfast or, uh, you know, what happens if I don't have that glass of wine at night and tr- check that off? Yes, I yeah. can do that. That's yeah. a little, uh, uh, a little win, a little win. I mean, yeah, that's right. And, and that's what it takes, but th- that's what, you know, even with exercise and you know, we, we bodybuilders don't start off, you know, lifting, you know, 300 pounds, you know, they start off with 20 pounds, you know, you know, so they just gradually increase that. So, so we got to make those little steps. When you're looking at, and I was going to ask you this before. So when somebody is uh, initially diagnosed and you're looking at what are the most important factors in getting the whole process started and, and, and two things that I, I really focused on at the beginning to learn as much as I could was one, my family tree history and two, genetic testing. And see if you do have those genes, whether it's the BRAC gene, whatever gene it is for the cancers. Um, are you, do you believe in that? Like that, that was, like I said, that was like one thing is like, I reached out to every person. I could, I learned everything I could about my family history. And it was like, okay, no one in my family that any close relative, close cousin, anything, no one's been diagnosed with cancer before. My grand, grand grandparents lived my grandma one of my my mom's side my grandmom's 96 and healthy and working every day still like it's crazy our family history so it was like we had no family gene no family genetics or what do you want to call it family history and then i did the genetic testing which i think is very important that you spend the money the couple hundred bucks and do that gene testing um do you ask people to do those two things i well i do yes and you know evaluate that or matter of fact i i asked him about your family history and uh, if they've had genetic testing, um, it, it definitely can give some insight, but it's not a requirement, you know, and because okay. it's still going to be the same things. Same results. So yeah. It's, it's still going to be the, basically the same type of recommendation. So, you know, whether you have, you know, BRCA1, you know, or HER2 new uh, or, uh, or PIK3, I mean, yeah. just whatever, you know, the KI dash, you know, whatever, yeah. you know, there's. It, it still is. There's some core basic things. You know, we have to have an anti-inflammatory diet. You know, we have to have sufficient protein. We have to be careful about the carbs. There's all, I mean, still basically the same type of a thing as far as like supplements. Now, we can use that information about some prescription, you know, treatments. Yes. So definitely, uh, you know, with that. And even some things can give us some insights. For example, um, and I think I've told you before, but my vitamin D receptor doesn't work. I've, I didn't do cancer testing, but I've done more like genomic general testing about diet and food and lifestyle. So I have an issue with my vitamin D receptor doesn't work. Well, that increases my risk of cancer and Alzheimer's and heart attacks and strokes. That's my family history. Yeah. So, but I still take the D, but knowing that I, I really like when I had that test, I'm like, oh, I need to do something else then. I need to make more changes, you know, in, in doing something else. And then I'll find out more recently with another genomic mm-hmm. test that I don't make collagen very well. And so, uh, so actually riding horses and, and, <laughs> and doing the crazy things is the, not the smartest thing for me. I'm at a very high risk of damage to joints. And, and I, I didn't know that, but that's part of the reason why I've got both my hips replaced. I warm out. And so I have a hard time making collagen. So there can be some things definitely, even in cancer, we can learn some things and we can target things. Um, but I, I have to admit, I don't really push the genetic testing right away. Um, and I, but I will take that and I don't try to ignore it. And I will use that. I have protocols for those things, but it still comes back to the basic type things. Yeah. You know, it's what we eat, our lifestyle and, and rest and stress um and, and and the basic things with that yeah i love that i love that so preparation and 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 as we started this whole podcast today we're going to wrap it up soon 
the initial diagnosis and and it seems like it's happening more and more and more to like i said younger people it's initial shock um once you overcome that original 24 hour 48 hour shock you need to take immediate action cancer is not waiting for you and i don't want everybody to understand that and and you do hear that i mean when i found out i had the tumor um and i finally found out like about two and a half weeks later that it had an in spread oncology and the surgeon it was around christmas time and i knew the surgeon was off for four weeks he took four three and a half four weeks off on holidays and i was like i was pushing for the surgery i wanted that hood of me and that initial understanding that um and we could talk about this for another topic as well when they originally go in there and you do find that out and you do find out what you have you have to be as we all recircle this be an advocate and push for everything to happen because if, yes. if if i didn't push for everything to happen my surgery would have been six to eight months later they were already talking about before i even got to surgery they were like okay let's let's do a round of chemo let's do this they want to do all these things before and i was like no we're going to get the surgery let me focus on everything else and because i did that the results of the surgery were incredible because those three months or two and a half months, I aligned my body. I, I filled my body with so much nutrition, so much goodness that the tumor had seen some great results and it made the surgery so much easier. So I'm, I'm, uh, if anything, you should look at my story and understand that how important diet, nutrition, and everything is supplements right. and all that, but also understand that I didn't take my foot off the gas and let people figure my future right and i want everybody to take that today and understand if you are diagnosed do not stop and just sit back and wait for people to give you answers you got to go out and find them and find individuals like keith and find people that could align you with the right answers and also help guide you in the right direction which is so so important and, and it's such a scary situation and in a, in, a, in a time of fear in a time of uncertainty in your life right Yes. And, and then also, you know, we need the help and, and the help could be a family member or a close friend. Yeah. Okay. And, and to help us with that. So not, uh, we need somebody to help listen sometimes and, you know, and, uh, and to help encourage us. And so I, we, we need that, uh, garden friend, that person that is going to be there that we can always go to. And, um, and it could be a mate. You know, it could be a friend, uh, you know, a, a coworker friend. I mean, but but we need that person that is going to help us too. And, and we haven't really talked about that, but we got to have that friend that's going to be there for us, friend or mate. You know, I love that. I love that. And we talked about in the beginning a little bit about surrounding yourselves around positive people and positive, yes. impactful mm -hmm. people. But that is exactly you needed that. And I and I was lucky enough. I had. A handful of different individuals that I could literally just pick up the phone and I was having a longer day and I could just talk to and 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 understanding. And I actually told them from the beginning, everybody I talked to, I said, listen, if I call you because I just need somebody to talk to, don't talk about cancer. Let's talk about something else. And 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 everybody got that. And it was like I would call an individual and and whoever, I mean, anybody that listens to this, um, there's there's a handful of them because I literally the first four months till I had surgery, Keith, I didn't tell pretty I, I had maybe 11, 12 people in my life knew I had this. Right. Very little. I was like, I don't want nobody to know about this. I don't want social media to know about this. I want nothing. I only announced that I had this after I was home safe after surgery. So I got diagnosed November 22nd and I only announced it February 17th. So that or 18th, or whatever it is when I got home. So also have that understanding where the more people you tell the more people that's it, it, there's more impact because just everybody wants to get involved so that was one of my things that i did was like surround myself around positive people people that are going to impact me and help me yeah. and just stick to that group don't worry about anything else don't just stay laser focused so i think that's another little thing is like you said surround yourself around people that you could talk to yes. that could just just when you do need that ear they're there for you and i think if you're lucky enough to have that make use of it hundred percent. Oh yes, exactly. And and you need that, you need that support. And, and I have seen issues uh, and relationships that I encouraged that, yes, it, well, you don't need that person. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. You, you, and I could tell something's going on and, and, and tell me about that person, that relationship. You don't need that person. Yeah. You, you, that is bad. You, you've got to do that. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that's a very core thing. We, we got to, you know, our, our, our soul and, and, and friends and mates are so important. hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. And that goes through everything in life. I mean, I remember yes. as a kid, my, my, my dad always used to say that this is an old saying, like, tell me your five closest friends. I'll tell you who you are. And it's, oh, and, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's who you surround yourself with. Right. So, I mean, having that, having those individuals around you that are positive and they're going to help you uplift you in a time of need is so, so, so valid. This has been absolutely amazing. Is there anything you want to leave it off with? No, except for we're, we're, we have a few people that we're going to be asking to come on and, and discuss a little bit more along some of these lines too, you know, and, and I think these are great questions to ask people. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to expand that a little bit more. I, I love that. And then, oh, this is great. This is awesome. I appreciate you, Keith. Like all weeks, uh, this is episode number six of the Prevail Over Cancer podcast. As we said last week, we announced, we kind of separated this and, and making it, it's, it's giving it its own little engine and letting it grow and see how many people we could affect and help and um, inspire. And uh, we're going to be hopefully hammering these out once a week and just giving as much information as possible. And you see by even just the comments on social media, like people are happy we're doing this, which is, which is, uh, that's all you could ask for. Yes, exactly. It's great. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, buddy. Until next week, buddy. Thank you. See you later. All right.